Welcome back, AP US History, to our first screencast on Reconstruction. So Reconstruction is going to be the time period between 1865 and 1877. So just at the end of the Civil War to about 1877. Now, Reconstruction really refers to the rebuilding of the South. So it really refers to the South, Reconstruction. Reconstruction of the South and rebuilding of the South and trying to reconstitute the social structure and really reform a region of society. So depending on who you're asking about the Civil War, the Civil War could either be referred to as the Lost Cause or kind of like New Hope. So it really breaks down upon racial lines. To white Southerners, the Civil War was this great lost cause. And Reconstruction is re the redemption period. Um, to African Americans and new free men in the, in the South, the Civil War was this great triumph. And the Reconstruction period is a time of great hope and chance and opportunity. So we're really going to kind of take a look at the two sides to Reconstruction and the two groups in the South and kind of their experience during Reconstruction. So the first that we're going to kind of look at are white Southerners. And so they have a very distinct view of Reconstruction period. And so the first thing we're going to take a look at is the destruction that the South went through during the Civil War. So we touched on this in class, but I just want to go into a little bit more detail here and get you a better idea of the, the destruction of the South. So the first thing here is wealth that the South is going to have destroyed. Prior to the Civil War, the South is responsible for about 50% of all U.S. exports. Primarily for them, it's going to be cotton. But as a result of the Civil War, about two-thirds of all of their wealth is going to be destroyed. So wealth as far as land wealth, um, infrastructure wealth. So they are in you know, kind of a horrible state as far as um, just the society in general being able to produce and kind of get back on their feet. It's going to be a huge task for the South. Um, livestock that's destroyed, so food supply. Um, about two-fifths of all livestock in the South are destroyed as a result of the Civil War. People in general, they're going to lose about a quarter of all of their white men between the ages of 20 and 40. So they lose a huge chunk of their population here. Workforce, um, for women, people to marry. Um, so it's going to have an effect on the social structure of the South in a big way. Now, losing those people are not the, is not the only effect on the social structure in the South. Um, the fact that Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and that's followed in 1865 by the 13th Amendment, which is complete abolition of slavery throughout all of the United States, and not just these states that were in rebellion. So slavery is completely abolished. So really this kind of throws the South into a, a social structure, an upheaval of social structure, because their entire society was dependent upon this, basically, you know, labor source and bondage here, these slaves. And so the fact that this might now be gone kind of throws the entire society into very much uncertainty. And how is it going to kind of get back on its feet? What is the new South going to look like? Now, throughout the South, starts during the Civil War, and then it kind of keeps extending after the Civil War to the Reconstruction period is starvation. Um, so you're going to have massive bread riots and um, riots at, towards the end of the Civil War when they're running out of food. Uh, and then it, this continues after into Reconstruction. So you do have a lot of starvation going on. Think about it. The South is completely devastated. Most of the battles are fought in the South. You, know, you have a lot of Southern towns are burned to the ground. Destruction of the land in general. So you have many major cities are just absolutely destroyed. And we discussed this when we talked about Sherman's march to the sea and some of the cities that were burned. But it's the countryside too that's burned. So you know places like Richmond, Virginia, up in complete ruins. Uh, Columbia, South Carolina is destroyed. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia. Just some of the major cities in the South are just in complete ruins. And that goes for the countryside as well in complete ruins. So the South is very much a devastated, destroyed region. And all of their things that they relied on before the war, like tobacco and cotton and rice and sugar, these cash crops that they relied on to make money, it's really going to take a huge hit in the South. And they can't recover. It takes them about 30 years. It's not until the 1890s that the South returns to its pre-war production levels of their major cash crops, you know, especially cotton, which was the king of the South.
but they don't return for 30 years. So the Civil War takes a huge hit, or the South takes a huge hit as a result of the Civil War economically. And it takes them a really long time to recover from this. Now, who do they blame for all of this? Do they blame themselves? Do they look at themselves and blame themselves for fighting this war that was unjustified, maybe? No, absolutely not. What they're going to say is this Virginia woman is going to kind of have a very common white Southerner's viewpoint of all of this. She's going to say, every day, every hour that I live increases my hatred and my detestation and loathing of the Yankee race. So they look at their, their plight, you know, their loss of wealth, their loss of land, their destruction, and they're going to blame it all on the Union. They're going to blame it all on the North. So rather than kind of diffuse tension and make the Southerners kind of relook at their lifestyle and kind of humble them, remember when Sherman says that he wants to humble their pride? It actually kind of has the opposite effect. It does not humble their pride, what happens to them uh, during the Civil War and during Reconstruction. It kind of almost emboldens them in their viewpoints. And so this is really where we kind of get this idea of the lost cause. The, 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 uh, the Civil War as this great lost cause for the South. And this is really going to kind of unique perspective of the Civil War. And really what it's going to do is, uh, the best way to kind of understand it, as far as I can understand it, because it's, it's hard for us to kind of look and see their perspective on the Civil War, so I think the best way to kind of look at it is to look at it as if the American revolutionaries who we studied had lost the American Revolution. And then how might we view those people, like George Washington or John Adams, and those great leaders of the American Revolution, that's kind of what starts to happen in the South. They look at the leaders of the Confederacy and they kind of put them up there, almost like martyrs, as these great people who are fighting for you know, this great cause. And they were fighting against the North who is trying to basically destroy Southern life. And they blame them for all the destruction in the Civil War and they blame them for the destitution and the, you know, the terrible conditions after Reconstruction. And it kind of starts to put these people up on this great pedestal that they were fighting this great cause and they lost, almost like this great underdog who had lost. And so that's kind of the perception of the Civil War in the South. And so quite the contrary to kind of turning their backs on the Old South, they kind of look back to it as this angelic, perfect time in, in society where things were great and you had you know, fantastic um, ec economy and a fantastic situation. And so this is a very different perspective than the Civil War is going to have in the North. And it's very much something that stays with the South. It stays with them in their mindset, and it's very important to them, the Civil War. Okay, so on the flip side, blacks in the South are going to have a very different opinion of the Civil War, and they're going to have a very different opinion and perspective on Reconstruction. So... For them, the big thing here, as far as the government is concerned, is how can the government help the freedmen, the people who are recently freed, adjust to being free? So you have four million people who are in bondage for years, for hundreds of years here. And the big thing is how can you help them to adjust to a new lifestyle, to a new lifestyle where you are not a slave? And so there's different perspectives on what can you do that's best for these people. So the first one will be land ownership. So this is kind of the first maybe way of improving them, giving them land, giving them small plots of land and kind of helping them to become self-sufficient. Second thing you could do is say, well, you know, land ownership is not the most important thing. The most important thing is getting them some kind of job, turning them into wage earners, just like the, the immigrant groups of the North who earn wages and eventually they're able to improve their status in society through earning and self-reliance. Education, you might say, is one of the most important things. The more you can educate somebody, the more they can kind of stand on their own two feet and they'll be able to get better jobs and improve their place in society. Or you might say, well, voting rights is the most important thing. Um, getting them the right to vote gives them a voice, which will give them representatives who will speak for them and care about their ideas and their agenda. So it really is a matter of perspective here as to what you think is the most important. So what the government does, basically right away, they establish this organization known as the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865. And the whole goal of the Freedmen's Bureau is to try and help newly freed men, former slaves, adjust to free life and try and help them 
on their path and improve their status in society, try and get them, you know, a leg up, try and help them to get to the right position in society. So let's first talk about land ownership. So overwhelmingly, if you ask the new freed men, this is what they wanted. They wanted land ownership. And so the rumor that starts to begin in the new freed men's communities is something called 40 acres and a mule. Um, so there's this rumor that goes around that the government is going to give every former slave 40 acres, a small plot of land, and a mule to help plow the land. Now, this is nothing but a rumor. And where the rumor kind of gains some validity is that when Sherman was making his march down, after he goes north, he comes back down um, towards South Carolina, towards Florida, and he comes across very unused land kind of along the coast. And what he starts to do is give these plots of land in 40-acre implements to slaves. Now, this was never an official government policy. This was much more of a, a something that Sherman did kind of on his own as an order as far as the military is concerned. And he viewed it much more as a temporary thing as well. And so this was never a widespread government idea to give every slave 40 acres and a mule. But it spreads among the, slave the former slave community. And this is something that they really wanted. Because they look at themselves, they're largely an agricultural people. And they believe that if you can give them land, then they're going to be able to sustain themselves. They're not going to need to rely on anyone else. Now, what the government did do is they passed the Southern Homestead Act of 1866. And what the Southern Homestead Act did was it gave former slaves preferential, uh, preferential treatment, I guess you would say, as far as being able to purchase public land. And though not a huge success, this is decently successful. Um, because by the 1890s, about one out of every three black families owned the farm where they lived. So it does kind of give them some level of land ownership. And it's, certain states is better than others. The Upper South is much better than the Lower South. Uh, a place like Virginia, about 50% of black families own their own farms. So pretty significant amount. Now, this kind of brought up big constitutional issues, kind of plantation land distribution. Could you break up a plantation and then give it to the former slaves? So you have these huge plantations, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. And the question became, can you break up these plantations and give small plots to the slaves who had worked it for years? And so the reason that the government is reluctant to do this is that they, they question the constitutionality of doing something like this, of taking somebody's property and confiscating it and giving it to other groups. And if you look at it, if you have an understanding of world history, it, it does sound kind of Marxist or it sounds, you know, kind of Stalin-esque of something that they would do as far as redistributing land. And so it's something that uh, the government is going to shy away from actually doing. So to them, the most important thing is to kind of turn the newly freed men into wage earners, to turn them into kind of like the wage earners of the North and to get their job, get them jobs. And they want this for a twofold reason. Number one, they feel like they need to get the South's economy going again. And the best way to do that is to get people back in the fields and working in the fields. And so I kind of call them, I kind of turn them like, they want to turn them into almost like the Irish of the South, like these free wage earners who are working and kind of helping the economy to grow again and get the economy back on their feet. And so this is what the Republicans in Congress are kind of pushing. And this is what they push with the slaves, to kind of stay on your plantation and to work for your former master, but under some kind of contract now, now as a free laborer and trying to set up a free labor system in the South. And so what develops here is going to be a system of sharecropping, which is very much kind of like tenant farming um, that happened throughout Europe in a lot of places. Uh, and so we're going to get much more into detail about sharecropping in our next chapter. So we're just going to kind of gloss over it here. We're not going to kind of spend some detail about on share cropping here. Now, education, as far as education is concerned, uh, this is kind of considered the big success of the Freedmen's Bureau, education. And we'll skip that for now. Uh, but higher education is developed as a result of the Freedmen's Bureau. So you do have some really important institutions that are around today, like Fisk University and Hampton University and Howard University. And so they are successful in certain places, and especially here in education. Uh, and you're largely going to have northerners coming down and helping to kind of lead this educational system in the South. 
Alright guys, I have more to talk about, but I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll see you guys tomorrow. And